right, time being 702, I call to order the Franklin School Committee meeting. The meetings are recorded by Franklin TV and shown on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 29, as well as recorded by Franklin Matters. All right, so I'm going to begin with our pledge student. Michael, Michael Aluga. If you want to, uh, Michael is a, an eighth grade student at Horace Mann Middle School. Michael is a passionate musician and an engaged student. We're pleased to have him represent our school tonight. Michael is an honor student at HMMS and is described by his teachers as a kind, hardworking young man with a great attitude and a love of music. Michael plays the French horn, commonly referred to as the horn, in the HMMS Symphony Band. He plays in the Honors Band and has qualified for the Central District Music Festival the past two years. Michael is interested in his continuing his musical pursuits at FHS next year. In addition to music, Michael has great interest in astronomy and geography. I'm sure uh, he uh, greatly enjoyed the solar eclipse. And he has a goal of traveling to Italy. So with a great pleasure that Mrs. Monty and the Horace Mann teachers recognize Michael tonight. We thank him for all the ways that he has a positive impact on the Horace Mann Middle School community. All will rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Now, uh, as is customary, we'll pause for a moment of silence. Thank you all very much. You guys want to get out of here? All right. Routine business review of agenda. Agenda look good. All right. Uh, payment of bills taken care of. Uh, payroll. Payroll is in order. All right. Let's see. FHS student reps virtual tonight. No. Unfortunately, we do not have any FHS student reps tonight. It's um, we're hitting that stride. Um, April stride. April, May, and June typically become pretty competitive in the evenings for uh, for folks to, to tune in, uh, particularly our students as things happen. So we do not have any tonight. <clears throat> All right, then uh, superintendent's report. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have a few updates to share with you. The first, uh, I'm excited to share, we recently received an update from the facilities um, department and the wastewater department on regarding how much compactor tonnage and the frequency of dumping that's decreased since implementing the food recycling program at Helen Keller, Remington Jefferson, and Horace Mann. To date, 70.7 tons, all encompassing, uh, of waste have been uh, removed from the regular waste stream since we've implemented the program. You may recall last year it, it made the news. Um, I believe it was at Keller, uh, but it was representative of all of our uh, complexes. And uh, the weight also includes compo compostable paper products and other additional food waste. Uh, these are agricycle numbers. So uh, it, uh, I'll provide a breakdown for you across all the schools, but the, the overall is 70 tons. And that will be shared, I believe, at the town council meeting from the wastewater department and facilities. But just kudos to everyone involved when I think about that project. When it was brought to our attention, uh, we met as a, a school department with our principals. Ms. Motti happens to be in the crowd. We had uh, all three of our middle schools engage with the facilities department, uh, our custodial department, and the wastewater department of the DPW to really come together and figure out how would this work what do the students need to do on their end? What do the teachers need to do? And it was really a great example of coming together as a community to, for, a, for a common goal, which is to try to eliminate as much um, unnecessary waste in the, in the environment. So um, that's a really positive thing. Really excited to announce that senior project has started. So we have close to 200 FHS seniors who began senior project on Monday, April 8th. These seniors will engage in a 70-hour internship demonstrating the knowledge, skills, and maturity they've achieved throughout their high school career or school career. Student projects that they, they uh, usually choose an area of study that is an interest or an area they plan to work so that they can gain practical experience before graduating high school. Senior project is unique 
a unique opportunity for our students to engage in some real authentic learning and experiential learning uh, of an area of interest and we look forward to their presentations which will take place on May 21st. I put a save the date in all of your calendars about six months ago probably for that date uh, and typically if you can make it uh, the school committee and some of the central office staff and, and other folks have the opportunity to uh, basically rate their projects and rate the presentations. There's a rubric, there's expectations for what needs to be included and, and reflective components. So it's a really great night and it's great to see these students who will graduate only weeks later and enter and become citizens in Franklin uh, move on. So it's very exciting and it's a great plug for the community that we have this in our high school, which is excellent. We have been engaging in the uh, school facilities assessment. We conducted a series of forums that have been designed to gather stakeholder feedback that builds off of the portrait of a graduate application workshop that occurred with a representative group, the visioning, which was a two-day workshop. Um, you heard Dr. Locker present last meeting. We took that information on the road and basically have met with the secondary level, the elementary level. Tomorrow we'll meet with our administrative team and we had the community last night uh, to engage in some of the outcomes and concepts that have come forward from the visioning in the portrait of a graduate work. Uh, in addition, we included some of the work and updates from the educational adequacy, which includes the architect's work around walking through buildings and facilities. So I anticipate having uh, another communication with a summary of feedback from these meetings. And uh, we've received a lot of great input. And I think our master planner and the educational architect are working really hard to help us create a very clear picture of the options along with the benefits and challenges um, with any of the options. So I anticipate more information as we move through the April break, April vacation and upon return. Um, the goal is to provide options and recommendations to the school committee that uh, build out a clear multi-year strategy that allow uh, us to make some decisions that are in the best interest of the district. But as I said, we're about two-thirds of the way through some of these stakeholder groups and we'll have to continue to engage in conversations but it's been a, a successful process so far. Last one, half day, April 14th, it's a Friday. It's this Friday right before the April break. The educators will have time to reflect on their goals from the year and compile evidence to showcase their work throughout the year. As April break approaches, I want to say lastly, uh, we want to wish our students, our families, and our staff and our leaders uh, a safe and restful break as we look forward to having students return on Monday, April 22nd. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, open the floor for questions or comments. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, so thank you for that um, and, and appreciate the, the updates, especially with the facilities planning um, and just kind of how that's all uh, running forward. I do want to make sure that we have the potential to have this called out uh, regularly uh, and, and kind of, you know, really detail what exactly we're talking about. Um, you know, I think facilities planning is, we understand we're in here often, we see exactly what we're talking about, um, but really making sure that the community understands that this is a concept of whether we have to you know, prioritize which schools uh, we're able to really kind of focus on and, mm -hmm. and maintain, um, but then also whether we have to reorganize how people, like the districts, right. if we have to go through redistricting. So I think that that's, it was great that you, you know, brought that information here, but I do think we need to make sure that that's a very specific call out and we use the terminology that people are gonna recognize right. um, so that we, we make sure that we promote that community engagement right. so no one comes up uh, later and feels like we were talking about facility, you know, facility planning, not redistricting or not, you know, the potential to, to modify kind of the, the plan for maintaining schools. So, yeah, that's great, great uh, feedback. I will say during the uh, one of the committee groups, the parents, some of the acronyms was a great example of it may make sense if you're in the education space, but it may not if you're not. So I think that was a bit of a just a, a good reminder. The second thing I'll say is during one of the um, educator meetings, they appreciated some of the clarity and some of the um, just information that was shared, but there's still uh, pieces where we're really trying to engage through a process, and I think the more that we can share, I use the word measure transparency, as to not create noise, but be really clear and deliberate about what we share and how we share it, but I think um, I agree with everything that you said around being able to bring people along and make sure that we're making the information accessible and understandable. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so do you have three questions tied to the facilities and wastewater removal? Mm -hmm. um, so the 70 tons, is that for just FY24 or is that total since the program has started? My understanding is that's total since the program started. 
Okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, definitely amazing. That's my understanding. If I'm wrong, we'll know tomorrow night if, um, or when, whenever the next meeting is when Mike might present it. Okay, perfect. Did, did, you know Steve? Were you at the? Okay, so then he, I think they might share more. Okay, thank you. And then, um, do we know what the cost savings that the town or the school district has received because of this program? No, I don't have any. Um, I don't have any cost figures associated with it. I only knew the amount of tonnage because they track the tonnage. Yep. That's the only information I had. Gotcha. Okay. No, no worries. Thank you. And yep. if, if, we can, if we can find that, that'd be good. Just to just to once again another place that we we put investment in either be it time or money to save something back because i would think that the, the cost of transport the the waste it adds up over time so um and the last question um I, I love the program and i think it just helps our students become better world citizens and, and really just making sure that we're caring for the planet um i i did hear a while back ago i think there was a student at jfk that proposed potentially using um instead of using plastic utensils transitioning to metal has that ever gone anywhere or has I that bubbled up to you it has not come across my desk but that doesn't mean that it didn't have legs or, or land somewhere i just i have not heard that but um i can i can check with the um uh, check with the school gotcha okay, okay. perfect thank you yeah uh, thank you um, very much for uh, this presentation, these updates. I would like to echo my, my colleagues' um, enthusiasm for the recycling program. I think it's wonderful that um, we're engaging in this and well, both setting an excellent example for um, our student and student population in terms of uh, sustainability in the future, but also that we're really living out our values um, as a school system. So, yeah, I mean, any um, potential that we have for this expansion, um, yeah, that would be would be excellent to, to hear and develop in the future. So, I mean, yeah, 70.7 tons, that's, that's incredible. So, yeah. We, we were an early adopter in the program as well, and what I'm learning is the infrastructure on the back end of where that goes and how that's done is that's a continued area where they're focusing to create almost like we have for waste mm -hmm. disposal a network that's been established for multiple decades to have a similar uh, system. So we, we were in early on this, and I think that was to our benefit, but I would yeah. be, I'm very excited to see where this goes and how we continue to, to find efficiencies in this area and savings and not have, um, not have the amount of trash in the street. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and when was the program started again? We started this last spring. Am I right on that? Yes, last spring, so. Okay. Okay. So it would have been in the fall. Annie Sullivan was the fall. Remington was the winter. Horace Mann was the spring. So la yeah, during last school year, we phased it in over the three complexes. Okay. So 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 seventy point seven tons within yep. course of essentially a year. So correct. That's wow. Oh, that, that's incredible. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to. Um, I've heard a lot from the students over at the middle schools about some of the senior projects and how the kids are going to be involved with, like, helping with the music program, the orchestra, and, like, the art program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kids are really excited about that because they, they bump into these kids at, like, the lifelong learning and, and things. So any chance you can get the high school kids <coughs> in front of the middle school kids, it's, like, right. such a win. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of point that out, and they're excited. So thanks. Um, the other thing, to your point, Al, uh, I know that uh, I want. I want to get her name right. I forget her name, but her last name is Dave. She is a, a, a friend of my daughter's sister, who reached out to me to get information on the um, food services because she wanted to bring compost compostable uh, utensils to the district. It was like a science project thing she was working on. So um, it may be in the works. I haven't checked in on her, but I sort of pointed her to the right direction, and um, she was doing it for maybe. Maybe it was her civics project. So um, anyway. Uh, I'll try and see if I can find out where she is at that. So that's a good, yeah, kind of a cool yeah. project. Yeah. yeah, somebody else thought of that too. So anyway, thanks. I'll bring that to Carl. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Lucas. It's a great presentation, and uh, I have only one question. That's a uh, couple of parents reached out to me about the food service what we were providing, and really appreciate for that. All those. Is there any cost saving we involved in this? Um, with the food service program? Yes. Um, so like, so I'm, what I'm understanding is people are uh, appreciating the food service program that we have? Yes. Oh, great. This is great. <laughs> I love it. It's the best news I've heard all week. <laughs> all right. Um, I would say that uh, we're really proud of our food service program, and Colin is our food service director, Colin Blaber, and he does a lot with partnerships. And I'll just give, I think there was a presentation months back where he talked about, 
he does a uh, a meat share, basically a co-op where we're uh, coming together with a variety of communities to purchase our beef and, and those products. He's uh, contracted with an organic farm down the road, Silverwood Farm, where he's at the point where he's talking to them in the fall about what they're going to seed and plant for us in the spring. He's that involved because he's thinking about his menu and it's really planful. The third piece is Red's Best is a uh, seafood company where a conglomerate, I don't know if it's a conglomerate, I might be misusing that word, I'm in the public sector, so forgive me. Um, but anyway, uh, he's worked with uh, Red's Best to provide uh, seafood uh, to the district in many ways. I think you've seen that on some of the menus and posted online. So we're really, we're really grateful because what he's been able to do and how he's been able to do it, um, he has a chef on staff that's able to buy in bulk prep it there, send it to the middle school so that it's consistent around the, the food products. There's a savings, cost savings there, and he does all this within his own budget, which is uh, basically um, has to self-fund. So um, he does phenomenal work, and we're really uh, lucky to have him in the program. And uh, my um, children say the same thing about the food and uh, whatnot. So thank you for sharing. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Very good. All right. Wonderful, thank you very much. All right, so we can kind of, uh, we'll move along uh, to guest presentations. We had uh, Horace Mann highlights. All right, so we're joined tonight by uh, the Horace Mann principal, Rebecca Motti, and the Horace Mann assistant principal, Jen Santasuso, who's joining us. Um, folks online may recognize Jen from her role as a high school assistant principal, uh, but she has been working uh, at the Horace Mann Middle School for uh, the last few months. Uh, Two months, two months, and we're really um, excited to have her join that team, and I'm excited to hear about the highlights at Horace Mann, and I'll kick it over to you, Becky. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for having us here tonight to highlight uh, Horace Mann Middle School. I'm Becky Motti. I'm the principal. I am in my ninth year as the principal at Horace Mann, um, and I will let Jen, I know... Lucas just did, but I'll let Jen say hello to everybody as well while we get technology going. Hi, Jen Santasuso. This is my fifth year as assistant principal in the district, and like um, Superintendent Jagir said, I've been working at Horace Mann alongside Becky for the last couple months. Um, it's been great having Jen here. We just thought we would bring a few highlights, uh, really focusing on community and who we are as a school, and then um, how we're trying to connect with um, both from the Franklin community all the way down to the classroom level. Um, so this is a little bit about us. Uh, we are the home of the lightning, and we have four core values that we try to promote in our school through the work that we do educationally, but also just the day-to-day -day living, uh, the life of a middle school student. Those core values are community, achievement, growth, and respect and I think if I were to highlight it's hard to highlight one because I feel like we weave these four um, ideas into almost everything that we do every day but community has definitely been something that's been a huge focus for us as we invite new people into our community as we partner with different groups as our students come back from having a time where they couldn't live as a cohesive community in the day-to-day -day operations of school life um, it's been important to really promote that and to name that whenever we are doing things to come together and to um, do things that positively impact one another as a community. Um, you'll see this picture of some of our eighth graders. We live by also the six pillars of character. Those are trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. Um, we have a PBIS, which is a positive behavioral um, uh, I always forget the I word, interventions and supports. Uh, we promote when we see students live those six pillars in action uh, because they're big words and we can say them, but what do they mean as uh, in the life of an 11 or 12 year old? Um, so we try to promote that when we see that. Uh, and when we do, teachers will highlight it. Students can earn a six pillar card. Um, they put their name into a drawing and we draw for um, gift cards every month. And that's just a way to really recognize and name and highlight what we see every day, um, living by those six pillars as well as our core values. Uh, we're also aligned districtly. So uh, the, the district sets its goals, and we also are one of three middle schools, as you know, so we are also aligned across the three middle schools with um, Annie Sullivan Middle School and Remington Middle School. Uh, we've set our middle school district goals to be social-emotional well-being, not just of our students, but of our staff. 
um, rigorous and engaging curriculum, high quality instruction, two-way communication, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You hear these words a lot, and so I hope to paint a little bit of a picture of what that looks like at the middle level, at least in our school community um, from this year. Um, community partnerships, again, that word community, and for us it's about not just um, within the four walls of our school, but within our entire community and beyond. And I'm really proud to say that through the relationships that our staff members have built um, professionally, um, in the, the relationships we as a school have with uh, different partners, different organizations that you can see on this slide, um, it's really about bringing great um, elevating the experiences for our students with these partnerships. So the Franklin Public Library is one area where we've really tried to partner, not just our school, but across the middle level. Um, we've implemented BLAST, which is our program we've had for multiple years. Um, that's bringing libraries and schools together and um, really building that partnership between the local librarians as well as our reading specialists to help students identify good books to read, to align uh, literature with the curriculum um, standards that we're, that we're learning every day in the classroom. Um, and another partnership that our reading specialist has promoted the last couple of years is a graphic novelist coming to the local library. We have um, him coming in May for a pen to picture graphic novelist panel in addition to some of our um, visiting author experiences during the school year. We want to make sure that we provide those experiences for all different interests, for all different areas of writing and reading, um, and that's been a great partnership with the library. Um, we've also earned some um, grant money through the Franklin Cultural Council. They've been a valued partner for many years um, for our school, whether that's through our visit for our visiting author grant. Uh, we had Jordan Sonnenblick join us this year, um, or for other um, enrichment activities within our school. Um, we've partnered with the Franklin Food Pantry and the Safe Coalition doing food drives and coat drives this year, a way to get our students involved outside, of the, the, outside in the community um, through the work that we do here in school. And we've also partnered with local businesses like Escape Into Fiction, either having book sales there or ha even inviting them to come and sell their Song and Blick titles so that we could just, again, bring that community together and <coughs> partner with different people who have that expertise. Um, they were able to host our Jordan Sonnenblatt community event. It was really well attended, and it was a great community event that, ca that built off of what we did in the middle schools. Uh, we also try to bring in guest speakers as much as possible. Mr. Vaca is in the audience tonight, and he has built a long-lasting professional relationship with Janet Applefield, who is a Holocaust survivor and has recently published her memoir. Uh, we're bringing her back again, not only to this, uh, to our school for eighth graders, but we are trying to have that experience for across all three middle schools. Um, uh, genocide education is something, as you know, the state is implementing that we put into place for all three grades. Um, this is something that Horace Mann has really been promoting the education of the Holocaust and Holocaust education for many years. So this is really complementary to the work that uh, Mr. Vaca and others have done for many years. But bringing somebody like Janet Applefield has really been a uh, culminating event for our eighth graders and to just have that experience of meeting someone who's had such a history and such a life experience is, is pretty amazing. Um, and then when you think of you know Janet and her her amazing life and then somebody like Maris Wicks who's a Horace Mann alum and um, has kept a relationship with the seventh grade teachers, Mr. Don Tremont being one of them. She is a science illustrator. She illustrates science graphic novels. And she has come back to our school several times to talk with our seventh graders about where her love of science actually took her down a path of writing and illustrating. Um, and again, it's just a great way for our students to see, similar to what uh, Ruth Ann, you were saying about the senior high school students, to see people who are now working in different jobs and professions, but that can relate to their middle, their own middle school experience to that. Um, like I said, we had Jordan Sonnenblatt come for our visiting author. I'm proud to say that this is the third time that he's come, so we've had nine years of middle school students experience uh, Jordan Sonnenblatt. Um, he's another student, who, uh, another author, forgive me, who writes about the middle school experience, so it's really something that we connect, um, connects very well with students. I know Jen was able to um, attend the whole school assembly and I think the messaging if you want to talk a little bit about the messaging maybe sure <clears throat> excuse me yeah it, he was exciting he he was so engaging the students even commented afterward like oh my goodness I can't believe that I was so engaged the entire time I didn't my mind didn't wander and I think it's because he spoke to them as a former middle school student who just 
had a struggle to focus in class, wasn't the ideal student, um, but was able to channel that in documenting some of his experiences and these books that kids love to read and that they find funny and they can identify with. So it was just wonderful to have someone who has taught middle school um, and who writes about middle school age kids come and speak to them directly. And I just want to give a shout out to Erin O'Leary, our reading specialist, and everyone who partnered with her to make that happen. Um, even leading up to that, I mean, I know we participated in read-alouds. Kids would go to different rooms with different teachers who would read some of his book, and so it's just such a great way to buy in um, student interest and then allow them to continue that during our flex time where they've been reading for the first 20 minutes. So um, it's also a great... Um, literacy program, if you will. Yeah, and I think that's what we try to do with any experience that we um, that we create. We also want to layer it in so that it has meaning, so that it relates, so that it touches as many students as possible. Um, so you'll see in some pictures later, um, all students participated in a whole school assembly with Jordan Sonnenblick, but then we had small group sessions where students could either have like a book club meeting with him to talk about um, the books and how he writes, and then also um, a writing session. So students who wanted to deepen that experience, they had some small group experiences and as um, Jen mentioned everybody read some of his book or or listened to a read aloud of some of his books because we want that visiting author experience to be meaningful for everybody to, to whatever capacity we can. Um, we also partner with the YMCA. We have our sixth graders go for a team building and high ropes um, or rope team building um, uh, afternoon. Um, where they also receive some um, anti-bullying education. That's part of the partnership and where the YMCA has grown in their programming. Um, so that's, again, just something to go even local within either Franklin or North Atterbury, depending on the ropes course that we choose, um, just to be able to um, receive some of their expertise and some of their experiences that our students wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to give a shout out to our school resource officer, Officer Amanda Ayer. She has been a huge partner for us, even in the day to day, but also when we identify themes that we want to really make sure that we're talking to our students about and they're understanding the community impact beyond just the school. Um, so we invite her to team meetings, whether we're meeting with students at a grade level to talk about things like harassment or things like social media. And then furthermore, when we identify themes like parent education for or family education for things like social media. Um, we recently had a school council meeting um, where we invited families to come and Officer Ayer had um, prepared a presentation with um, Officer Gove um, that really I think spoke to just some of the things that as a police officer what they're noticing and then we could also partner with what we're seeing from a school perspective to just build some of that education and awareness to ask and answer each other's questions and to brainstorm things that we can do to better educate our students, to better educate our families and to all be aware aware of how we can help students navigate and have a healthy relationship with social media and technology. Um, so beyond that, community and citizenship are two words, our core values, and also one of our six pillars. And I think in the life of a middle school student, they are growing, they are changing, they are understanding the world in a different way. So we really try to promote that idea of where they can, where they can step into leadership, where they can show positive citizenship, where they can show a positive impact on the school community. Um, in some ways, we've seen a little bit of a shift that we've had to make because things like our community service club or student council, um, those things are not a part of our day-to-day -day, uh, this year, uh, but I'm proud to share that we still have some, um, some ways in which we are promoting this within our students, um, in our school community, and our students are really continuing to step up in these ways. Um, Peer Leaders is um, in partnership with the Anti-Defamation League. This is our seventh year where we've been training a group of um, seventh and eighth grade students from each middle school um, and then they then go and teach some lessons about inclusivity, respect, tolerance um, to our sixth graders. So just again that partnership with an outside group but also to build that um, that leadership within our students within the school setting. Um, I, I, we did get word this year that the Anti-Defamation League is not, is not continuing the peer leader program beyond this year, so we will have to find other partnerships and other, um, other people to collaborate with in this way. Um, but I really do feel like through our work with them, we've, we've created a lifelong partner in um, just asking for that help and support whenever we need it from um, representatives of the Anti-Defamation League as we're working through um, diverse diversity, equity, inclusion, different things that might pop up along the way as a school community. Um, 
Some of the things that we've asked our students to still step into without a community service club are things like leading a food drive, uh, leading a spirit week, um, decorating our halls so that there's positive messaging. Um, and those are some things that we've had a lot of different students step in to do as the year has gone by. You'll see the recent haul that they've collected in our food drive um, where the food pantry had to bring their truck to pick it up. Um, really, really great to see that just on a daily basis they're committed to understanding what the needs are of the food pantry tree, making it a fun and engaging. We had it be a competition between advisories on, on who was bringing in um, these different items, identifying the high needs items of the pantry, and then really making sure that uh, we connected with the food pantry to bring those, uh, those items to them. Um, those are a couple of pictures of our peer leaders in action. They will go through different activities and different lessons. They, again, become trained to then teach our sixth grade students some of these lessons. And again, seeing students teach and um, be in those leadership roles, I think, is really important for our sixth graders. And then just a couple of our fun pictures that are up um, just to keep our, pos our hallways positive and to, again, tap into the, um, the skills of our students in our, our hallway artists. Unified basketball is another thing that we've continued for um, a second year building off of the high school program. Um, our music program, we've, uh, we've heard and seen some of our students, our pledge student, um, students then turn into music mentors, whether through lifelong learning or even sometimes our seventh and eighth graders will attend sixth grade rehearsals uh, to build some of that mentoring skill. And then, like I said, living by those six pillars is another way where we recognize student leadership and where we've been able to continue doing that despite not having clubs or some things um, this year. Um, the PCC is another partnership that's been hugely valuable for us and we continue to build. Um, I think the middle school PCCs are always looking for more volunteers and more uh, participation, um, but I'm so lucky to have the group that I do have and they've been really working hard to commit to the funding for field trips, um, the funding for enrichment activities, like I said, helping us spear our food and clothing drives, social experiences. They really wanted to make sure our students were engaging in some of those fun activities evening activities as well and so a winter social was a new tradition that our school started this year and here are some pictures from that it was it was a great great night um, and the students really enjoyed it and it was great to see how many parents came together to provide that opportunity for our for our school community we wouldn't have been able to do it without the number of volunteers that we had and um, their generous donations uh, we've also again without having a yearbook club have our PCC managing our yearbook um, so we're able to promote all of the things things that we do in that way. And this is what we're able to get through a lot of that partnership are just some really hands-on, authentic experiences for our students. So these are some pictures from our recent field trips. Um, Save the Bay is a great organization that our seventh and sixth graders participate um, in either um, a um, uh, looking at the salt marshes and examining the salt marshes at Colt State Park for our seventh graders or actually taking a boat ride in Narragansett Bay in Providence with our sixth graders to talk about water quality and to talk about the impact of humans on the water and the ecosystem in the bay. Um, so just things to build their awareness. We have students up on those rope courses um, challenging themselves at the, as they start off as sixth graders. And um, like I said, some of these small pictures of our small groups that got to meet with Jordan Sonnenblick um, as well as a visit to the State House with our civics curriculum. We've built an eighth grade field trip to uh, tour the State House, and it's interesting. Our students in elementary school do that, but to see them then do it as eighth graders again with the level of knowledge and awareness that they have, it's been really meaningful to hear some of their anecdotal reactions yeah. to how meaningful that experience is for them. Um, and so these are just things that I want to make sure we're showing that these things are happening with all of those community partnerships that we're engaging with. Um, and what that's doing is it's, it's enhancing and complementing the work that we're doing in the classroom every day. So there's a lot of work that's going on to make sure that we have that high quality instruction and that engaging and rigorous curriculum. Uh, these are a couple of pictures from taken in action from our classrooms. Open Syed is a science curriculum that we're in the second year of implementing. Teachers are attending professional development to be able to roll out this very authentic phenomenon based curriculum. This picture in the center is the start, the launch of a unit in science where um, they're talking about sound waves and so the launch is to take apart a speaker and to start asking questions about what parts go into the idea of making sound and therefore the students from there continue to build off of that skill set or those initial questions to build um, and master the standards in that unit. 
Um, universal design for learning is something that we've really uh, been focusing on at the middle level as well. Uh, that's eliminating barriers and using different instructional approaches to deepen student learning. So whether that's student applying their learning, like in this sketch of um, uh, genotypes and phenotypes of taking all that they've learned to adapt it to, in this case, the minions, if they're going to be yellow or purple, and what, what's recessive and what's dominant. But we've also had students do their own family traits and just being able to apply that to um, their, own, their own experiences or an experience on a sitcom or something like that, which is actually really fun to see what, what's on their minds as, as eighth graders. Um, another thing that I want to highlight with universal design for learning is the idea of small group instruction within the classroom so just being able to group students and to be able to um, in this case one of our special ed teachers meeting with our students to give immediate feedback and to check in and it's just the idea of building some really um, designing the lessons and designing the instruction in a meaningful way to get as much out of our out of the time that we have and to get as much um, a building towards mastery as we can with our students um, and then project-based learning I think STEM is one great example of just the hands-on and the projects um, again creating those authentic experiences for our students in order to um, help them collaborate, learn to work with each other, and create um, products. The last thing I wanted to highlight was, as I was saying, like the community from the outside looking in and um, the most, uh, you know, from the, from the most micro lens, maybe just what a classroom looks like. Um, it's no longer just one teacher sitting in front of the students. Um, there, a lot goes in behind the scenes in order to make the um, rigorous, engaging curriculum and high quality instruction a reality. Um, and so I just created a quick flow chart showing all of the steps, but then all of the people and time that's, that's devoted to to making something like literature circles. So in the case of um, literature circles, students get to select a novel, they read with a small group, and then they're applying whatever it is that the standards were decided at the start of that literature circle unit to be able to uh, be learning and building towards mastery. Um, so things like professional development time, but also uh, important roles such as our humanities director, our curriculum leader, special educators, our reader, reading specialists, and ELA teachers go <coughs> into the steps of unit design, novel selection, the instructional design, and then how are we giving assessments and feedback to our students. So just wanted to be able to show the flow and um, from even that more micro lens, there's so many steps and so many people involved in the work that we do every day. And then at the end, just bringing it back to our students and a big thank you to all of you for everything that you do to support us at Horace Mann Middle School. Thank you both very much. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, appreciate everything. And, and Jen, too, a really nice special call out as well. Just for your flexibility this year. Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, um, smiles with, with that one. It was, it was wonderful uh, hearing you kind of come on board, just both as a, as a school committee member, but as a, as a dad uh, of, uh, of a kiddo at the school. So thank you very much for, you. for the flexibility this year. Greatly appreciated. Uh, but with that, though, uh, open the floor to questions and comments. So, yeah, um, great program. I became a big fan of Osman School now. Thing is, um, which program supports the anti-bullying uh, program? Like, you, what program you have for anti-bullying? So we have, um, we have, like I said, uh, they get a small, uh, a small dip of that in our sixth grade when they go to the YMCA. There's an anti-bullying component to that. We also have, as part of our health curriculum, a bullying, an anti-bullying unit. Um, the program that the teachers are using is called Second Step. It's part of our. It's a social emotional curriculum, and it it. Um, captures the five competencies of social emotional learning. It's also something that we use, we use that unit for the, uh, the bullying unit for um, in our health classes and then a majority of the lessons in the other three units we teach through our advisory program, which is the start of our day. That's all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Um, thank you, um, sure. I've got two kids over at Horace Mann, so. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a, a challenge being a middle school educator, administrator these days. Um, uh, I, w I wanted to just, um, uh, one of the things, and, and Jen, I, you know, we do hear all the smiles. We do hear the frowns from the high school too. Like, you know, so yeah. <laughs> I, you know, um, you're, you're somebody who I, I hear from teachers uh, widely respected and appreciated as an administrator. So 
um, for what you do. So, you know, hang on, we're going to get you guys this budget fixed, you know. Um, but um, I'm curious, just um, one of the, you know, with the clubs not being here this year, um, I, I get concerned about, you know, obviously middle schoolers, the, the bullying is always a category. Specific to the LGBTQ community, um, I just, I think back, I came to, they had sort of a, our town council had a big forum not too long ago where it was, it was debated whether or not the town would raise a pride flag. You know, some people saw it political, some people saw it as an overarching kind of inclusivity message. Um, that's my point of view. Um, and so without having that club as kids are sort of navigating, you know, that, that tween age, um, like I know, I think it used to be Miss Flaherty and stuff, is that that's not happening anymore, right? That, that particular so the club's not happening, no, right. which is um, which is unfortunate. Um, I am happy to say, though, um, through our advisory program, that has been something that we've made sure that we wanted to address, um, so that all school, all three schools, with our advisory being aligned across all three middle schools, and with not every middle school, I think two of the three had one of those um, LGBTQ clubs. Uh, we wanted to make sure that those types of um, that that type of uh, lessons of acceptance or lessons of again who we are as a community were uh, were met for all of our students. So that is something that when we don't have things like clubs that will maybe design a week for our students to celebrate, there are other places like our advisory program being one of them that can help with some of those um, items that maybe aren't part of the curriculum standards but are very important to ensuring that our students are seen, um, that there's <coughs> awareness, and that there's also um, education on the part of um, you know, um, you know who we are as a community. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it would it would be good to consider. Um, and and I know you guys, band was the problem. <laughs> I know you need more people mm -hmm. in the bodies in the schools. Um, but just something to think about. Um, and hopefully we can get those clubs back. I just um, it it's it's important to to sort of convey that tolerance. I think some parents, what, I, what I'm hearing from parents whose kids are maybe navigating that a little bit and don't know what to do and how to manage it and parents are a little bit not sure how to guide them, um, maybe throwing a couple of resources or like a, you know, some sort of message to the children like, hey, you know, if you're struggling with this specific topic, here's like a point person yeah. who, like maybe a counselor, I, I don't know. I just, I hear parents struggling with like how to advise their kids and there used to kind of be a spot to get that kind of advice for the people who are actually navigating it yeah. personally. So just a thought. It's a great idea and our yeah. student services is another, we have two yeah. counselors in our student services office and I think that's another place where uh, we're looking for ways where they can reach out um, to our school community for um, different groups to form or for um, different, um, I know one of our counselors has created a newsletter for families to push out that way with some of those links. So okay. those are ways that we are looking to continue to keep that, com that two-way communication mm -hmm. um, for our students but also for our families. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you want parents helping you, you know, exactly. create the environment. So mm -hmm. um, the other thing, um, uh, I wanted to just mention is um, I, I was at uh, I, I was at the Spanish Honor Society induction that they had last week, and they had some Hispanic food out in the. And I know that some of those um, children, I talked to some of the parents and some of the kids from the high school were going over to the middle schools and teaching some Spanish lessons. Um, I think at Remington they did that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, anytime you can get their peers, like you guys know better than we do, that the middle schools. Don't, don't want to hear from their parents about anything ever. Um, so, yeah, I know your kids are the same age. So anytime you can get, you know, um, high schoolers or anyone, uh, I was just kind of, the, the language department specifically is, like, seems to me an area where those kids are looking to yeah. do that. And I know the National Honor Society parents were like, is this going to continue? Like, with yeah. the budget concerns, languages have been hit hard. So um, mm -hmm. just to kind of keep in mind that there is, like, a, there's a definitely a demand for that um, to try to not like, yeah, lose the momentum that we've had as a district. So for what it's worth, I know it's been addressed in the in the budget. Yeah, um, I know other things that we've done with um, 
not the level of success that we that our goal is is yeah. even partnering with high school clubs so to your point of yeah. our, our older students within the district how can they be of support and I know that the clubs the club offerings at the high school have been even more robust than the offerings at the middle level yeah. so um, being able to think about um, some of our advisory conversations have been trying to pair up with um, different clubs I know when different clubs create middle school experiences we just had the scope club promote um, yeah. an evening event for yeah. us so we we are trying to build that communication and to leverage what they're doing for our students and also um, to tap into some of their expertise or their desire to help um, build awareness and just that idea of community within our, our middle schools yeah and, and it sounds like that's like the goal and, yeah. and with with like a, a, a you know more stable budget you mm -hmm. probably will have a little more bandwidth to kind of do those things mm -hmm. I know mr. Vaca back there who's always here is a like a like a legend in town yeah. um, there was some photos that I shared recently <laughs> about um, <laughs> well I mean it, a lot of our educators are um, but I shared a photo recently on uh, the social media about him bringing some kids to the senior center yes. um, things like that go so far mm -hmm. when it comes to like the community at large understanding how education has evolved mm -hmm. and how this project-based learning and things like mm -hmm. this like they do take investments but the but the rewards are just humongous. Yeah. So. And our opportunity for our students to interact with different members of the community mm -hmm. that don't walk yeah. into our schools but are very important and to build right. those relationships, I agree. Right, and, and I was over there on Friday and I can tell you a lot of those seniors are saying to me, you know, don't put me in that category of a senior that doesn't support education. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna support this yeah. school. So it's, it's good. So I know you hear always like, you know, people aren't fixed incomes, they don't wanna support the schools. It's not all of them, so. And I, I just want to promote that it's taken just that creativity on the part of our teachers yeah. to look for a grant or to look for a way to connect like uh, Mr. Vaca has with the Senior Center or to, you know, make sure that we still have a food drive with the help of the PCC and our students. So just ways to make sure, like you said, that the momentum doesn't completely stop, but we find other ways. Um, it is, you know, there is only so much that we can do. Those clubs provided a lot, um, but there is a lot of creativity and commitment still on the part of our teachers to ultimately create that um, you know that community but also those citizenship and leadership lessons for our students yeah yeah well thank you um, I appreciate all you're doing awesome. all right. I do want to uh, just remind everybody we do keep minutes uh, here at all of our meetings so mr. Vaca uh, being a legend is now an official <laughs> public record <laughs> Uh, thank you both so much um, for this presentation and highlighting um, your schools. It's absolutely apparent just um, how much uh, building this community um, is, a, is a true value um, to not only both of you, but your entire team. Um, I think it's you know, wonderful how you mentioned you, you know, both you know, call out in a positive way and reward um, demonstrations by the students of you know, your core values. And I think that's, that's excellent just for the leadership to really establish um, that culture of you know being you know, kind and respectful to others and building that community and just like uh, taking a look at you know the, the long list of community partnerships you know with the the library cultural council food pantry and, and local businesses as well as the other opportunities you have for for trips and, and other partnerships you know through the PCCs um, it's it's you know fantastic just the enriching experience that uh, you guys go really above and beyond to provide for the students here. So yeah, thank you very much for, for bringing this information to us. It's great to see what you're doing, and yeah, please keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, as always, thank you for everything you do. Um, we know that the middle level, that's very pivotal in a student's life, and educators play a critical role because they're now expanding their um, uh, scope of trusted adults. Uh, so thank you for what you and your staff do. Much appreciated. Um, just listen to this presentation. I am um, very encouraged and I love that what you're doing regarding the uh, literacy work, all of it, because with all of the things that our students at this level are being bombarded with, technology, you know, friends and whatnot, reading doesn't fall high on that list. Um, so all the things that you're doing, at least to help engage them to find <coughs> to kind of build that uh, appreciation for the written word um, is great in terms of getting the authors in, um, offering the audio um, books to listen to if they don't want to read it, because you never know what might kind of get somebody to yes. grasp to it and, and dive in deeper. So so thank you for that. Um, and even just partnering with the, our local library, that's great, just to kind of bring literacy to the forefront. Um, 
Um, I know that's that's a tough one. I know we talk about math and sciences a lot, and it's easy to um, focus on that and see where people struggle because there are people that are just not math people and there are people that are math people. But I think from a literacy perspective, you need that to help even understand math and understand and, and interpret what's being written in the in the test. So appreciate that. Um, I did have a question though on the YMCA team building. Mm -hmm. um, thought that was a great program, especially for sixth grade, mm -hmm. just to help broaden the students' perspectives. Um, can you speak to like how that came about and how does how is that funded now? Yeah, so the program, um, the only funding that we have to pay for because there, I think there's a partnership through the YMCA to offer this for schools is for the buses to get there. So it's a relatively low cost um, uh, field trip, if you will, for our students. We do do it in the fall of sixth grade and we do do it with that intention of we have two elementary schools coming together. We want to make sure they see themselves in a new light as middle school students and we also want to um, create, you know, middle school can be a scary transition and there's a lot of nerves and there's a lot of things to, you know, adjust to and that idea of um, setting goals, taking risks, leaning on each other, trusting trusting your, your teammates, um, I think are important um, lessons that they can learn. And then I was just walking by, we still have a lot of pictures up um, from the fall of the students in action, which I think is just a very, again, valuable experience to kick off their orientation into middle school. Um, so we are, we like to continue that. We noticed that the, um, uh, the program at the North Attleboro Y ends up offering a little bit more as far as the ropes experience which is the highlight for the students. So we like to, uh, we've been going there versus Franklin, but um, it's through the Hockamock. And um, again, like I said, it's a bit relatively low cost to us uh, with I think the benefit of giving that experience for our students and letting them see what another local organization can provide too. Great, no, thank you, appreciate that. And, um, yeah, definitely something worthwhile And I know. I, I wasn't aware that the other uh, middle schools as well participated as well, so that's great that it's... I know they have in the past. I don't know if they went this year, but I know that in the past the different schools have all gone. Um, and um, I think depending <coughs> on what how they do their orientation, they may or may not go. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but once again, continue doing the great work that you and your, your employees do. Um, it definitely sets a great foundation for when they, for them when they transition to high school, just to have those skills and experience and exposure to different things. So, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation and, and just kind of the information as to what all y'all are doing. A um, couple things that really stuck out to me and actually it's echoing some of what my colleagues have already said is the importance of really kind of bringing kids out and, and kind of getting them out of their shell and, and moving past just education where they're engaging with the community and really seeing kind of the importance of that and just the sheer number of things that you have at the school uh, that have various aspects of community engagement I thought were really interesting. Um, but then also looking at what is actually being taught in school um, and the subjects. Um, as a geneticist myself, <laughs> I did enjoy the, the fact that you're already addressing some rather complex yeah. things. Yeah. It, it amazes me how much that has kind of drifted down. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, it was like sophomore, junior year of high school <laughs> was the first time we heard those words. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate the fact that you can convey complex situations like that and that you have those kind of <coughs> really holistic, engaging um, science programs. So please keep that up. I think it's really important. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you uh, again so much. Greatly appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you. All right. All right. So we're going to move on to discussion action items, uh, starting with the FY25 budget. Okay. Um, the hearing, we had the superintendent's recommended budget come before you last meeting. Uh, we discussed the Q&A, and at this point I'm going to be put forth. I recommend approval of the FY25 school budget in the amount of $81,319,261 as discussed. All right. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to approve the FY25 Franklin Public Schools budget. Is there a second? Second. All right. Open the floor up for uh, discussions questions, comments? Um, yeah, we have, um, actually, we'll, we start it all off. Uh, Ms. Gallagher, if you want to, if you have any anything to, uh, to say, the floor is yours. Yeah, just, um, but, you know, I think that this budget really reflects the, the needs of the schools right now, and um, it's really, 
Is it? Thank you very much. Much of the same. I think this is really going to be an important decision for us, um, and it really highlights what is going to be required uh, to really put together a holistic package uh, for educating our students uh, in this day and age. Okay. Um, just want to say thank you to Dr. Dutch and his team. Um, I know I've had asked a lot of a million questions <laughs> about, about the budget and asked a lot of changes to be made, um, but I appreciate the work that's been done to the line by line budget item. Um, seeing the FTEs from FY24 to FY25 in relation to what we're asking for for FY25 helped really clarify things because you look at something and you say, okay, well, it's, uh, you know, $175,000 and it's like, well, what is this? Is this? You assume it's like one person and you come to find out it's two, three people mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, this is more rational and it's, it's easy to, to digest. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, for the folks that may have not looked at the updated budget, please do, do so. I think this will help make some more sense in terms of what's being asked because at the end of the day, um, what's supporting our students are people and understanding the people that are there and the amount of people to support it. Um, you reduce one person, we cut X amount of dollars, it's a person, and, and how does that impact your, the services that your students are getting? So I uh, <coughs> definitely appreciate the, that change. Uh, ha happy to have done it, and I, I appreciate all the questions and, and requests for clarification. When you're, when you're doing the budget, you're in it, and you're very familiar, and you know everything, and you assume that the general public does as well, and so I, I appreciate another set of eyes looking at it um, from a different perspective. It helps. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to you know, Lucas, Bob, Tina, Paula, John, and everyone who put um, long hours um, <coughs> into this. It's a, a monumentous task, particularly considering our current um, fiscal situation, both for the school and the town. Um, certainly wasn't easy. Um, it's hard taking a look at our current situation and projecting out to see where we are, where we're going, and kind of contrasting that with where we'd like to be. But I think, you know, the information that you presented us both over these past few months as well as in um, joint budget subcommittee meeting our, our conversations it's been a wonderful opportunity for everyone on this committee to truly vet you know go through ask questions and get that information out there and the understanding of, of where we are and this vote tonight certainly is not the end as as we all know it's going to be we have a still quite quite the journey ahead of us you know both the our work on this committee as well as work with our, our partners on the town part of government so you know, thank you again. Uh, we appreciate it, and yeah, this is you know what uh, again our our values that we're putting in to provide the best possible educational experience for Franklin Public School students that we can with within the means that we have and where we would like to be. And um, yeah, it's certainly not the end of the road, um, and we'll look forward to um, continuing the work and doing the best we can for our Franklin Public Schools and the town as a whole. So thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I am the only sort of feedback I've been getting from the parents that I talk to is, um, are we asking for enough? Um, because I think we all can agree we'd like to maybe have some more breathing room, but um, there's, you know, there's other sort of big fish to tackle or, you know, big projects to tackle and, and efficiencies and things like that through facilities and whatnot. But for now, um, I'm just kind of speaking to the constituency, the stakeholders out there that are putting pressure on me personally because I'm sort of like this override person to get the number you know, higher um, to just give more room. But I think that this is a very fiscally responsible, pragmatic, smart budget. And we put pressure on our administration to, to you know, the best they can. And I think that this is a realistic budget so that we can sort of breathe and then do maybe in the future, you know, instead of having to come for an override of $10 million, we can say, hey, you know, we need 200000 for this particular curriculum and we can do these little sort of project, you know, asks of the community that are a little more um, palatable. But, you know, it's been a long time since the community has been um, asked to vote on a ballot question. So I just want to um, convey to everybody that sort of wants me to 
for push for more that I I do believe that this is going to give us the room to, to make more investments in and in creative decisions going forward. So um, I'm gonna, you know, obviously approve this. So thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would like to thank uh, Lucas and team for patiently answering all the questions. <laughs> 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 and uh, when I got the feedback, like, uh, it's a really very tight budget, and I definitely needed the override for the benefit of our future Franklin. That's all. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Thank you all. And, um, I also get an opportunity to uh, to chat too. Not nearly close to ten o'clock either, so I can keep going. <laughs> um, you, you know, uh, you know, Lucas and your entire staff. This is a fantastic budget. Um, you know, there's definitely always opportunities to to kind of grow and expand. There was that whole. I mean, we asked you to do four budgets, um, and uh, you know, one one of those was that that Thrive model that I think is you know we could. There's a lot more that, that we can do in, uh, in the years to come. And I, I, but what we have in front of us that, uh, that stabilize and that partially restore, you know, still amounts to, you know, it's a 12.9% it's a increase um, you know, with this budget when historically uh, the, the allocation has been about, like, I think, 2.7%. Um, you know, we're certainly going to know more in the coming days. I think on Friday, uh, the town administrator releases uh, his uh, recommended uh, budget. And, uh, you know, but unfortunately, just looking at the realities, it's unlikely, I think, uh, is, is a very fair statement to say that we're actually, you know, be able to see this 12.9% increase to kind of come in with this budget that, uh, that we have. And, um, you know, so I just want to just state, uh, you know, I know uh, tomorrow there's a town council meeting and um, I'll be um, there kind of speaking just at the citizens comment, just in support of uh, this budget as we uh, we go to approve it uh, with the request that, uh, you know, my colleagues uh, kind of do what uh, what they can um, to be able to fund this budget as it stands. Um, you know, up to an, um, a, uh, an operational override, if that's what it's going to be required, uh, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Franklin's tax base just does not have uh, the funds to be able to, to kind of sustain a 12.9% increase, but this is a budget that has been very well vetted um, and is required in order to kind of continue to educate our children moving forward. Um, and so, again, I want to thank all of my committee members, uh, you know, and superintendent, your entire office uh, for putting forth uh, this budget. And, uh, you know, look forward to conversations with, uh, with my other colleagues as well as, uh, as we do kind of move forward. Uh, and, again, to, to kind of show support for uh, this budget uh, because we, we do need to, to be able to, to fund the education of our children. And just historically, uh, you know, the, the numbers aren't aligning. Um, but, uh, but again, I think in the days to come, as the town administrator does release his report, we'll have a much clearer idea of exactly where we stand, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, with, you know, how close the town is able to get to this $81 million budget. Uh, and then we'll just have continued conversations moving forward, or I, I, I hope that we do, um, to be able to make it so that we can get to, to, to this number. So, um, I'll just wait. I'll wait. No. Uh, You're I'm, I'm not going to follow up the chair in his comments. I'll wait for the process to unfold. All right. Um, so uh, that's it, unless there's any other questions, comments. Um, all right. Seeing none, uh, the vote will come on a roll call uh, motion. Can I make one more comment? Yeah. Sorry. I, I just, I, I do think. Um, I've done sort of what the community has asked of us as school committee members and gone out and and talked to the town council, met with people one on one, tons of phone calls, tons of emailing. And um, I do feel like we have a solid chance to get on stable footing here. 
Um, I do think we have the majority support of parents that are aware. So I guess I just want to speak to the community while it's while the subject's here that uh, you can make a difference. You can email the council and ask them to support uh, these experts who are bringing this budget forward uh, and what is required. This isn't like a, um, <coughs> this isn't a, like, like you pointed out, this isn't the Thrive budget. This is the stabilized budget. So, um, you know, anybody out there who wants to help uh, our efforts and our advocacy um, can, can lend that sort of statement over to the town council and, um, you know, speak during citizen comments and just encourage um, this budget because I know that uh, we certainly will be. You know, we've talked to the Office of Campaign Finance. We had a special meeting last week and they said, you all are volunteers. You are elected officials. You could be working for this override committee if you want, clearly. Um, but I just think that, you know, citizens, you have one email goes a long way. It's, it's, um, it's more impactful than you may think. Um, even a simple couple lines saying, you know, we really support the schools putting forth this budget and the work that the superintendent and his team has done. So, okay, that's all I'll say. Thank you. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll come on uh, roll call uh, motion. Uh, Gallagher? Yes. Uh, McNeil? Yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. Sampoli? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. And Callahan? Yes. All right. Motion carries. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your support. And we appreciate the, uh, the feedback and comments that you did provide. And I know um, you were the ears to the community. When you received information and had questions, we appreciated hearing it. And then I want to thank the community for also contacting Dr. Dutch or me directly or Ms. Malati directly around questions. And um, we just appreciate your support in trying to move this forward um, for the betterment of our system. And um, it's, it's, it's not lost on us. So thank you very much. And we'll just move to the next stage in the process. Okay? All right. Thank you all. Uh, then uh, next up, we got uh, school choice. Okay. I recommend the school committee not accept new school choice students for the 24-25 school year as discussed. All right. uh, is there a motion? Move to not accept new school choice students for the 24-25 school year as discussed. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussions, Can I, questions? Can yeah, I just please, add a little bit of context as well? So uh, every year, the school committee is required to vote annually on whether you would accept school choice students. That's a program that exists within Massachusetts where varying districts, make, uh, the school committees make an approval. If you have space and slots that you could have students come from another community to join um, our school system, uh, we have in the past, probably 15 years ago, was probably the last time that we had voted. A lot of it had to do with enrollment. I will say that because we are in the midst of a master facilities plan and trying to determine what we need to do for the residents, I think we need to prioritize the students who live within our community before we can open up any classroom seats and, and accept others. It's not to say it's off the table, it's an annual vote, but I would say in this case I would not recommend that we uh, open up something that we have not had open for the last 15 years until we have solid footing mm -hmm. and a very clear strategic plan on how we will navigate the the next uh, decade with short-term and long-term goals related to master facilities planning. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, uh, then uh, seeing no discussion action any discussions or questions uh, we'll do another roll call vote uh, Gallagher yes uh, uh, Griffith yes Charles yes McNeil yes Callahan yes uh, Sullivan yes and San Pauli yes all right motion carries thank you I recommend adoption of policy JFABB admittance of foreign exchange students as discussed this is a second read so it's up for adoption uh, is there a motion as discussed? Move to adopt policy JFABB, admittance of foreign exchange students, as discussed. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, discussions, questions, comments? All right. Uh, seeing none, vote will come on a motion. Uh, again, roll call. Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? 
Yes. McNeil? Yes. Callahan, yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. Sao Paulo? Yes. Jump on the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, uh, discussion only items, uh, none. For two information matters, uh, sir, uh, superintendent evaluation. Uh, superintendent evaluation has not yet met. However, um, we have discussed a uh, timeline and we'll have the um, presentation of the evidence next month and a um, better established timeline for members to um, submit the evaluations and have a report by the end of the school year. So stay tuned for that. Okay. And uh, budget. So, budget was approved tonight unanimously, <laughs> which we are all a fan of, um, but as mentioned, is certainly not the end of this discussion. Um, please, everyone, stay tuned for um, the continued discussion in terms of the broader town budget as well as the um, approved number for us. Um, our next budget meeting um, of the, for the subcommittee, I believe, is scheduled for the 30th. However, uh, there will also be a joint town and school committee meeting on April the 24th, Wednesday where the overall financial uh, picture as well as the subject of override will be discussed. So, and then we also have the upcoming finance committee and town budget hearing. So um, work is certainly not done. Please stay tuned, stay informed. All right, uh, policy. Um, policy we met tonight. Um, we started uh, drafting some information about um, fundraising just to tighten that um, policy up and um, just we adopted tonight the foreign exchange policy, so uh, nothing too juicy. Just um, <laughs> you know, we'll be meeting same time next month. Uh -huh. um, community relations. Yep. Um, our normal meeting was supposed to be yesterday. We delayed it due to the um, comprehensive uh, facilities uh, family forum uh, for um, visiting uh, yesterday. So we are meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. Okay. And how about uh, joint PCC? Yep, uh, we met yesterday at a normal time. Um, Mr. G. Gear spent some time uh, reviewing the budget uh, situation and just getting the, the PC up to speed. And uh, real quick before we move on with the community relations, again, loving the, the newsletter. Absolutely fantastic, uh, great, uh, great job, and thanks for all the work <coughs> from the whole committee uh, that went into that. If you haven't checked it out, I think that, um, I know it's, it's on Facebook, um, and it got broadcast as well via regroup to all families, correct? Correct, yep. And it's also on the um, school committee website as well. There's a uh, newsletter section that has an archive of all of the previous newsletters. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It's, it's fantastic. Um, how about uh, SWAC? Yeah, we met uh, last week. Most of the time we discussed about the June some upcoming uh, farmers market. And we discussed how to develop the website for the SWAC as well. Awesome. And then uh, mental health and well-being? Um, uh, met this morning, and um, the uh, two videos now that we have uh, in, in sort of draft form will be ready probably the next the next meeting or, or two. And then we'll get that attached to the um, community relations uh, newsletter awesome. and, and also yeah, going out. So we're going to be at the Strawberry Stroll also, um, like the mental health and well-being task force will have a booth. So. That'll be helpful. That's June seven. June seven. Yeah. Okay. Uh, DEI. DEI's next meeting is April twenty fifth. All right. And uh, comprehensive facility assessment. You want to? I just I shared a a brief update in the superintendent's report, but I defer to to you or uh, uh, anyone else who wants to speak right. to as well. <laughs> so um, we've uh, had um, two kind of quick back to back meetings. Um, I know we had uh, last week, it was just last week that we met, um, and uh, where uh, uh, one of the things we kept kind of, um, uh, we were really talking about uh, was, I know um, Mike D'Angelo, again, kind of gave really great insight into the capital uh, improvements over the, the next 10 years, really kind of being able to take a look at all of the different projects uh, that, uh, that are gonna be down the road or currently scheduled for each of the buildings, just so that way we kind of have a, a clearer idea of, you know, we got we got a number of different buildings, facilities here, which ones are going to need the repairs, the roofs, the boilers, um, and also which ones too, I think he spoke about, I know like the, uh, the complex is about how much life they still have, uh, with a couple of little updates here or there. Uh, even got on to talk about um, insulation and, uh, and heating. And uh, that's actually something we, I mean, uh, had uh, reached out to him as well. I'd love to be able to kind of share back, hopefully soon, but a breakdown of each of the buildings and just kind of how much it, it costs to, to heat and to kind of run each of the buildings that, uh, that we have. 
and this week we've been having some community forums, mm -hmm. uh, some some forums, I should say. Yeah. On Monday, just yesterday, we had a family community forum uh, where again Dr. Walker kind of presented a lot of the information, uh, some of the information that she already kind of presented back to us on the 26th um, about Portrait of a Graduate, about educational visioning, um, and uh, just where we had an opportunity for some <coughs> media engagement, and then uh, Superintendent Jagir, and then we had some for teachers as well. Mm -hmm. We had, a, we had a forum yesterday during the eclipse uh, with our secondary educators, and then today with the beautiful sunshine day, we had our elementary join us after school. And so far, we've, we've tried to just bring people along. I call it measured transparency, kind of having accurate information to share. But I will say the takeaways thus far this week have really added a lot of good information for considerations, for concerns, for goals and hopes. and ways to mitigate concerns. I thought that was an interesting question to ask people like, hey, I, I'm curious about you know X, Y, and Z. And to just to just build off of um, our school committee member Griffith's point around just trying to make sure that we provide as much information that's as clear as possible as we move along in the process. I anticipate the outcomes of these forums has really generated a lot of great information. In addition to, that's one element of multiple things that we need to consider as we consider master planning across the board. So you brought up facilities, uh, the facilities kind of the nuts and bolts mechanical. We talk about enrollment. We need to discuss um, how we're organized, how does our ed visioning and the outcomes of that work tie into how we anticipate educating students, how our industry programming and special education um, programming exists across all of our schools. So I do think this is not uh, a situation that um, we're, we're gathering as much as possible, but I don't anticipate not having some really clear uh, information for folks uh, this year and even by the end of the month and into May. I think we, we, we know enough. And I'll just reiterate to the community, if you've been paying attention, we have been talking about these types of concepts in my, since for a long time, but I do know um, after the closure of Davis there, the redistricting of students there, the redistricting assessment that we conducted last year that uh, school committee member Charles and I um, oversaw. It's all the forums from that and kind of where we landed today is last year there was a concerted effort to say we need a little more information in a long-term plan that considers all options. And I'm, I'm, um, this is this is what we are doing. And I think we're trying to get on the table like, hey, let's really zone out and let's provide tangible, um, realistic, rational options for our district. And I think we owe it to uh, our students, we owe it to our community to, to just really do this work and do it well. But I anticipate in the coming month and even month and a half that we should have some real tangible ideas of how we can implement and what would make the most sense for our district as we look not only to a year, two years, but a decade down the road. Appreciate it. Thank yep. you very much. And, and on that note, too, I think the next uh, meeting that we have for that subcommittee will be uh, May 1. Right. All right. Go into consent agenda. I recommend approval of the minutes from the March 19th, 2024 school committee meeting as detailed. I recommend acceptance of a check for $3,500 from the Franklin Educational Foundation for supplemental supplies as detailed. I recommend acceptance of a check for $6,900 from the Keller PCC for field trips as detailed. I recommend acceptance of two checks totaling $455 from Music Parents as detailed, $40 for in-house enrichment, and $415 for field trips. I recommend approval of the request of Brad Hendrickson to take first graders to the Providence, Rhode Island Children's Museum on May 2nd as detailed. I recommend approval of the request of Brad Hendrickson to take second graders to the Roger Williams Zoo in Providence, Rhode Island on June 6, 2024 as detailed. I recommend acceptance of a check for 3,600, I'm sorry, I recommend acceptance of a check for three thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars from the Annie Sullivan Middle School PCC for field trips as detailed. All right, uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as detailed? Move to approve the consent agenda as detailed. Second. Second. All right, uh, any discussions, questions? All right, uh, roll call, uh, Gallagher? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Charles? Yes. McNeil? Yes. Callahan, yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. And Sampali? Yes. All right, motion carries. 
All right, uh, up next we got Good of the Order. Again, uh, first meeting of uh, the month. Have an opportunity for school committee members uh, to weigh in <coughs> on any you know, uh, items you want to kind of discuss in the future or ways in which you can kind of see uh, us improve in any uh, way, shape, or form. Uh, what, what kind of? Yeah, um, I, I just want to take the opportunity. So we had a great time, um, multiple conversations today around facilities, around the, the potential you know, discussions for redistricting and making sure that that analysis is done. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see that we put a specific line item on the, on the agenda to discuss that so that people understand that that is in fact what we're discussing uh, when we're talking about these, you know, the different planning um, committees and looking at facilities that we are, you know, basically, you know, use that exact terminology so that people are aware. Um, and they also have a window to look in if they are pressed for time, knowing, you know, possibly right after the superintendent's update, um, just having that line item right in there uh, so that everyone has an opportunity and knows that we are talking about this now so that when we talk, continue talking about it for the next three months, next six months, it, it, it has been very well publicized. Um, and also potentially during that, uh, looking at timing updates. You know, I know we've said we're about two thirds of the way through now. Mm -hmm. Time starts becoming clearer as we get towards the end. I I'd absolutely realize that. Um, but if we can start giving dates as to whether, you know, this is when we're gonna have additional information, this yep. is when we're gonna have, um, you know, potential times for decisions and guidance for when people can really make sure to voice their opinions yeah. um, kind of along that way. I think that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gallagher. No, I'm okay. Um, no, I'm okay. I'm good. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, then uh, moving on, citizens' comments. Are there any citizens in the audience, in person or online, who would like to make a comment on an item not on tonight's agenda and falls within the committee's purview? Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh. uh, this cousin. Um. Sorry, Dr. Rogers, did we have? Some of the hand raised. We, we did. did, and it appears that they took their hand down. Oh, no, nope, it's back. We do. All right. Uh, so um, I'll just ask if we can get uh, name, address, and, and try to keep it within three minutes, please. Hello? Can you hear me? Gotcha. Yep. Yes? Yes. 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 Excellent. Hi, this is Selena Cousin, 114B3. Um, as a parent of a sixth grader who's new to middle school this year, I just wanted to express that many of us are just still so disappointed about the lack of clubs and leadership opportunities for these middle school kids. You know, as we enter the third and final trimester of the year, I can't help but compare the middle, the you know, this sixth grader's middle school experience so far with that of his older brother, Rico, but five years ago. Um, and while I appreciate I listened to the earlier presentation, I, you know, I know how creative everyone's trying to be, but these sixth grade kids, you know, at least the ones from Kennedy and I believe in the other schools as well, also have no clubs or student council or after activities in elementary schools pre-COVID, which for the class of 2030 began in first grade. So still with no clubs and way too few leadership opportunities. I just wanted to take a minute to continue to express my concern and other concern as well that this cohort of students has really missed out and continues to really miss out on these important activities that are helping them to become well-rounded leaders of our community. And I just strongly want to encourage our community to consider passing an override that will afford these kids with at least the same opportunities as the students who came before them, if not more. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Rogers, anyone else online? Not Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, move on to new business. As uh, Mr. McNeil mentioned, we have a joint town and school meeting. Um, in essence, a meeting with uh, the town council and school committee that will take place on April 24th. I'm just confirming the time as I look here. I want to say 7 p.m., but I'm 
I think that's accurate. I have a 7 p.m. at Franklin High School, just the change in venue in order to accommodate um, the community in a more uh, open, comfortable setting. So that will take place at Franklin High at 7 p.m. on April 24th. Um, our next meeting coming up in the next few meetings, um, Mr. McNeil also mentioned superintendent evidence of the work that I've done, but ultimately we want to also uh, include in, in that or in those messaging and the presentation is the work of the district from the district improvement plans so that we can communicate where we are with those and provide some um, some metrics and measures of how what we've been able to do in our progress towards those goals uh, and ultimately the biggest things on the agenda are really looking at the continuation of the budget conversations that need to take place and the master facilities are the two priorities that we have uh, within the district to to really move those forward and um, prioritize those in the coming weeks. All right, thank you very much. And then, uh, so lastly, I'll uh, look for to entertain a motion to adjourn. <coughs> Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Any uh, discussion? Nope. Uh, I have roll. discussion. I have one, more, one thing I want to say to people. I was going to hit that gavel. Yeah. Don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> one more thing. <laughs> I want to tell people that. Um, uh, who are waiting to see what would be the cuts if the overhead fails. That That is being worked on, at least on the school side, that I know for sure is a, is a, is a very delicate and difficult thing to navigate, I'm sure, because I'm sure that the, the teachers are feeling a little insecure right now, uh, rightfully so. So um, I think by the joint meeting that we have with the town council, I would expect we could talk about some of those things that are at stake um, that people are are sort of asking us for um, in some sort of official correspondence from from the school district. So um, we are we hear you and we're, we're we're doing that also. That sort of doomsday budget, I guess. So great thing to end on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, I would like to oh, I would like to thank all the email senders uh, across our school yeah. district the great emails and some of them are uh, provided a great information about each and everything. Thank you for everyone there. Thank you. All right. Then uh, seeing uh, no other, uh, vote will come on a roll call. Uh, Gallagher. Yes. Griffith. Yes. Charles. Yes. McNeil. Yes. Callahan, yes. O'Sullivan? Yes. Tom Polly? Yes. All right. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. We are now producing this in collaboration with Franklin TV and Franklin Public Radio. This podcast is my public service effort for Franklin, but we can't do it alone. We can always use your help. How can you help? If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements, and I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at suresteve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008, and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy it. By the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app. Search in podcasts for Franklin Matters.